Part ten of the Beckoning Fair One. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Morgan Scorpion. The Beckoning Fair One by Oliver Onions. Chapter ten. As time went on, it came to pass that few except the postman mounted Oleron stairs, and since men who do not write letters receive few, even the postman's tread became so infrequent that it was not heard more than once or twice a week. There came a letter from Oleron's publishers, asking when they might expect to receive the manuscript of his new book. He delayed for some time to answer it, and finally forgot it. A second letter came, which he also failed to answer. He received no third. The weather grew bright and warm, the privet bushes among the chopper-like notice-boards flowered, and in the streets where Oleron did his shopping the baskets of flower-women lined the curbs. Oleron purchased flowers daily. His room clamoured for flowers, fresh and continually renewed, and Oleron did not stint its demands. Nevertheless, the necessity for going out to buy them began to irk him more and more, and it was with a greater and ever greater sense of relief that he returned home again. He began to be conscious that again his scale of sensation had suffered a subtle change, a change that was not restoration to its former capacity, but an extension and enlarging that once more included terror. It admitted it in an entirely new form. Lux Orco, Tenebrae Jovi. The name of this terror was agoraphobia. Oleron had begun to dread air and space and the horror that might pounce upon the unguarded back. Presently he so contrived it that his food and flowers were delivered daily at his door. He rubbed his hands when he had hit upon this expedient. That was better. Now he could please himself whether he went out or not. Quickly he was confirmed in his choice. It became his pleasure to remain immured. But he was not happy, or if he was, his happiness took an extraordinary turn. He fretted discontentedly, could sometimes have wept for mere weakness and misery. And yet he was dimly conscious that he would not have exchanged his sadness for all the noisy mirth of the world outside. And speaking of noise, noise, much noise, now caused him the acutest discomfort. It was hardly more to be endured than that newborn fear that kept him on the increasingly rare occasions when he did go out, sidling close to walls and feeling friendly railings with his hand. He moved from room to room softly and in slippers, and sometimes stood for many seconds closing a door so gently that not a sound broke the stillness that was in itself a delight. Sunday now became an intolerable day to him, for, since the coming of the fine weather, there had begun to assemble in the square under his windows each Sunday morning certain members of the sect to which the long-nosed Barrett adhered. These came with a great drum and large brass-bellied instruments, men and women uplifted, anguished voices struggling with their God, and Barrett himself, with upraised face and closed eyes and working brows, prayed that the sound of his voice might penetrate the ears of all unbelievers as it certainly did Oleron's. One day, in the middle of one of these rhapsodies, Oleron sprang to his blind and pulled it down, and heard as he did so his own name made the subject of a fresh torrent of outpouring. And sometimes, but not as expecting a reply, Oleron stood still and called softly. Once or twice he called, Romilly! and then waited, but more often his whispering did not take the shape of a name. There was one spot in particular of his abode that he began to haunt with increasing persistency. This was just within the opening of his bedroom door. He had discovered one day that by opening every door in his place, always excepting the outer one, which he only opened unwillingly, and by placing himself on this particular spot he could actually see to a greater or less extent into each of his five rooms without changing his position. He could see the whole of his sitting-room, all of his bedroom except the part hidden by the open door, and glimpses of his kitchen, bathroom, and of his rarely used study. 
He was often in this place, breathless and with his finger on his lip. One day, as he stood there, he suddenly found himself wondering whether this madly, of whom the vicar had spoken, had ever discovered the strategic importance of the bedroom entry. Light, moreover, now caused him greater disquietude than did darkness. Direct sunlight, of which, as the sun passed daily round the house, each of his rooms now had its share, was like a flame in his brain, and even diffused light was a dull and numbing ache. He began at successive hours of the day, one after another, to lower his crimson blinds. He made short and daring excursions in order to do this, but he was ever careful to leave his retreat open, in case he should have sudden need of it. Presently, this lowering of the blinds had become a daily methodical exercise, and his rooms, when he had been his round, had the blood-red half-light of a photographer's dark room. One day, as he drew down the blind of his little study, and backed in a good order out of the room again, he broke into a soft laugh. That bilks Mr. Barrett, he said, and the baffling of Barrett continued to afford him mirth for an hour. But on another day, soon after, he had a fright that left him trembling, also for an hour. He had seized the cord to darken the window over the seat in which he had found the harp-bag, and was standing with his back, well protected in the embrasure, when he thought he saw the tail of a black-and-white check skirt disappear round the corner of the house. He could not be sure. He had run to the window of the other wall, which was blinded. The skirt must have already passed, but he was almost sure that it was Elsie. He listened in an agony of suspense for her tread on the stairs. But no tread came, and after three or four minutes he drew a long breath of relief. "'By Jove, but that would have compromised me horribly,' he muttered. And he continued to mutter from time to time. "'Horribly compromising. No woman would stand that. Not any kind of woman. Oh, compromising in the extreme!' Yet he was not happy. He could not have assigned the cause of the fits of quiet weeping which took him sometimes. They came and went, like the fitful illumination of the clouds that travelled over the square, and perhaps, after all, if he was not happy, he was not unhappy. Before he could be unhappy, something must have been withdrawn, and nothing had yet been withdrawn from him, for nothing had been granted. He was waiting for that granting, in that flower-laden, frightfully enticing apartment of his, with the pith-white walls, tinged and subdued by the crimson blinds to a blood-like gloom. He paid no heed to it that his stock of money was running perilously low, not that he had ceased to work. Ceased to work? He had not ceased to work. They knew very little about it who supposed that Oleron had ceased to work. He was in truth only now beginning to work. He was preparing such a work, such a work, such a mistress was a making in the gestation of his art. Let him but get this period of probation and poignant waiting over, and men should see. How should men know her, this fair one of Oleron's, until Oleron himself knew her? Lovely, radiant creations are not thrown off like how you do. The men to whom it is committed to father them must weep wretched tears, as Oleron did must swell with vain presumptuous hopes, as Oleron did, must pursue, as Oleron pursued, the capricious, fair, mocking, slippery, eager spirit that, ever eluding, ever sees to it that the chase does not slacken. Let Oleron but hunt this mistress a little longer, he would have her sparkling and panting in his arms yet. Oh, no! They were very far from the truth who supposed that Oleron had ceased to work. And if all else was falling away from Oleron, gladly he was letting it go. So do we all when our fair ones beckon. Quite at the beginning, we wink and promise ourselves that we will put her ladyship through her paces, neglect her for a day, turn her own jealous wiles against her, flout and ignore her when she comes wheeling. Perhaps there lurks within us all the time a heartless sprite who is never fooled. But in the end, all falls away. 
she beckons, beckons, and all goes. And so Oleron kept his strategic post within the frame of his bedroom door, and watched, and waited, and smiled, with his finger on his lips. It was his duteous service, his worship, his troth plighting, all that he had ever known of love. And when he found himself, as he now and then did, hating the dead man madly, and wishing that he had never lived, he felt that that, too, was an acceptable service. But, as he thus prepared himself, as it were, for a marriage, and moped and chafed more and more that the bride made no sign, he made a discovery that he ought to have made weeks before. It was through a thought of the dead madly that he made it. Since that night, when he had thought in his greenness that a little studied neglect would bring the lovely beckoner to her knees, and had made use of her own jealousy to banish her, he had not set eyes on those fifteen discarded chapters of Romilly. He had thrown them back into the window-seat, forgotten their very existence. But his own jealousy of Madley put him in mind of hers, of her jilted rival of flesh and blood. And he remembered them. Fool that he had been! Had he, then, expected his desire to manifest herself, while there still existed the evidence of his divided allegiance? What? and she with a passion so fierce and scented that it had not hesitated at the destruction, twice attempted, of her rival. All that he had been. But if that was all the pledge and sacrifice she required, she should have it. Ah, yes, and quickly. He took the manuscript from the window-seat and brought it to the fire. He kept his fire always burning now. The warmth brought out the last vestige of odour of the flowers with which his room was banked. He did not know what time it was. Long since he had allowed his clock to run down. It had seemed a foolish measure of time in regard to the stupendous things that were happening to Oleron. But he knew it was late. He took the Romilly manuscript and knelt before the fire. But he had not finished removing the fastening that held the sheets together before he suddenly gave a start, turned his head over his shoulder and listened intently. The sound he had heard had not been loud. It had been, indeed, no more than a tap, twice or thrice repeated. But it had filled Oleron with alarm. His face grew dark as it came again. He heard a voice outside on his landing. Paul! Paul! It was Elsie's voice. Paul, I know you're in. I want to see you. He cursed her under his breath, but kept perfectly still. He did not intend to admit her. Paul, you're in trouble. I believe you're in danger. At least come to the door. Oleron smothered a low laugh. It somehow amused him that she, in such danger herself, should talk to him of his danger. Well, if she was, serve her right. She knew, or said she knew, all about it. Paul, 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 Paul he mimicked her under his breath. Oh, Paul, it's horrible. Horrible, was it, thought Oleron? Then let her get away. I only want to help you, Paul. I didn't promise not to come if you needed me. He was impervious to the pitiful sob that interrupted the low cry. The devil take the woman. Should he shout to her to go away and not come back? No, let her call and knock and sob. She had a gift for sobbing. She mustn't think her sobs would move him. They irritated him, so that he set his teeth and shook his fist at her. But that was all. Let her sob. Paul! Paul! With his teeth hard set, he dropped the first page of Romilly into the fire. Then he began to drop the rest in, sheet by sheet. For many minutes the calling behind his door continued. Then suddenly it ceased. He heard the sound of feet slowly descending the stairs. He listened for the noise of a fall, or the crash of a piece of the handrail of the upper landing. But none of these things came. She was spared. Apparently her rival suffered her to crawl abject and beaten away. Oleron heard the passing of her steps under his window. Then she was gone. He dropped the last page into the fire, and then, with a low laugh, rose. 
he looked fondly round his room. Lucky to get away like that, he remarked. She wouldn't have got away if I'd given her as much as a word or a look. What devils these women are! But no, I oughtn't to say that. One of them showed forbearance. Who showed forbearance? And what was forborne? Ah, Oleron knew. Contempt, no doubt, had been at the bottom of it. But that didn't matter. The pestering creature had been allowed to go unharmed. Yes, she was lucky. Oleron hoped she knew it. And now, now, now for his reward. Oleron crossed the room. All his doors were open. His eyes shone as he placed himself within that of his bedroom. Fool that he had been, not to think of destroying the manuscript sooner. How, in a house full of shadows, should he know his own shadow? How, in a house full of noises, distinguish the summons he felt to be at hand? Ah, trust him. He would know. The place was full of a jugglery of dim light. The blind at his elbow that allowed the first light of a street lamp to struggle vaguely through. The glimpse of greeny-blue moonlight seen through the distant kitchen door. The sulky glow of the fire under the black ashes of the burnt manuscript. The glimmering of the tulips and the moon daisies and narcissi in the bowls and jugs and jars. These did not so trick and bewilder his eyes that he would not know his own. It was he, not she, who had been delaying the shadowy bridal. He hung his head for a moment in mute acknowledgment. Then he bent his eyes on the deceiving, puzzling groom again. He would have called her name had he known it. But now he would not ask her to share even a name with the other. His own face, within the frame of the door, glimmered white as the narcissi in the darkness. A shadow, light as fleece, seemed to take shape in the kitchen. The time had been when Oleron would have said that a cloud had passed over the unseen moon. The low illumination on the blind at his elbow grew dimmer. The time had been when Oleron would have concluded that the lamplighter going his rounds had turned low the flame of the lamp. The fire settled, letting down the black and charred papers. A flower fell from a bowl and lay indistinct upon the floor. All was still. And then a stray draught moved to the old house, passing before Oleron's face. Suddenly, inclining his head, he withdrew a little from the door jam. The wandering draught had caused the door to move a little on its hinges. Oleron trembled violently, stood for a moment longer, and then, putting his hand out to the knob, softly drew the door to, sat down on the nearest chair, and waited, as a man might await the calling of his name, that should summon him to some weighty, high, and privy audience. End of part 10